Welcome to a very special episode of the Real Sharks Podcast. Today, in our opening segment, we got two special guests coming on. Actress and producer, Susan Goforth, and director and producer, Timothy Hines. And we're going to have... Hey. hey, how's it going, guys? Hey. How are hey. you? We got everything working here. Yeah, we're good to go. Can you hear us okay? I can hear you. Can you hear us? We can hear yes. you. Yep. Welcome to the Real Sharks podcast. Thank you so much for joining hey. us. Thanks for the invitation. This is wonderful. I'm Rob with the rest of the Real Sharks crew. We did a brief introduction before you guys came on. So again, thank you for having us. So, we wanted to go ahead and get started with the show. Uh, let's go ahead and talk about uh, the meat and the bones of what's going on. First of all, what's your guys' favorite films? That was such a hard question because there are so many. And I have to go with Moana. <laughs> I do. I thought we were going to pick Elvis. She's... Well, Elvis is one of my favorites from this past year. But overall, That's right really now, good. I'm vibing Moana. She, she dragged me into watching Elvis. And uh, I... I you know, biopic. I just didn't want to watch a biopic, and it turned out to be really a good film, except for oh, what yeah. country Tom Hanks was. I couldn't possibly tell you what his accent was, but uh, <laughs> but it was uh, uh, right. It was much more spectacular than I was expecting, and and uh, why um, why for me it was Elvis right now currently because it really told the truth of the movie industry, the the entertainment industry, a lot of how. You know, we see stars shining bright. We see the the uh, celebrities in in you know in real time, and then you always read twenty years later. This is what really happened to them. You always see that, and it's amazing because um, I, I'm friends with uh, Elvis Presley's niece, and Graceland. And in fact, I spoke with her a few days before the. Um, before uh, Lisa, Marie Lisa Marie passed, passed away. Oh, wow. And uh, they were they were very pleased with how the movie told the truth of the struggles. You know, they left out some stuff. And, you know, we've all seen the story redone. You know, Kurt Russell did a version of Elvis, you know, yeah. uh, uh, many years. But, uh, but you know, the director is, you know, who did the film is absolutely a crazy man, you know, who put that together with all of the montages. And I, I think he, he did Milan, uh, Milage. And it was it was interesting how you know how life imitates art because Austin Butler has been working nonstop for two right. decades and yeah. here he first on the scene as if brand new, you know. I would also say um th- this doesn't really quite qualify as a movie, but I just saw the pilot episode of uh uh, a film, uh, a, a, a TV series called Poker Face that was set in Las Vegas with uh, uh, Natasha Leone. Mm. I, uh, Natasha Leone. Look, she's correcting me on everything. It's not Mulan. <laughs> 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 uh, no, it was, I thought that was wonderful. I thought it was really well scripted. And, uh, you know. <laughs> you were thinking move that cartoon, kid cartoon. Okay. All right. Well, too many kid cartoons. You know, we have a 10 year old. Right. So. Yeah. Shazam is also another one of my favorite movies, you know, because we were getting ready for the sequel. <laughs> the first Shazam Haven't was seen. very good. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. So maybe your kid will also like Poker Face. You should you just, just, just see. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know with him. You know, he's, 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 uh, marches to the tune of his own drum. Yeah. We're kind of like, you know, ASD family, just to put that out there, our, our son is very brilliant and very uh, autistic. And then we didn't really know it because Timothy and I are both on the spectrum. So we just thought it was normal to, like, you know, teach yourself to read before you could talk and things like that. We're like, oh, well, you know, everything is their thing. So we were um, both diagnosed yeah. with autism while our son was being uh, with a, a doctor for, he was seeing a doctor uh, wow. for his autism. And the doctor looked up at me and said, have you ever been tested? And I went, no, I'm mature. I'm decades into my life. What are you talking about? And so See, I can't make eye contact. I have practiced. And now, you know, but the funny thing is that, you know, it works for me as a director, 
but it turned out that I am on the spectrum. And I went back and called up everybody in my life and said, hey, guess what? I'm a and <laughs> like I had no idea that people sort of saw me that way already in my um, uh, some of the former people in my life were saying things like well that makes sense so uh, anyway I don't, I don't know quite how <laughs> so apologies for all my social miscomings oh the, no it's okay we like to have fun no, no. Okay. um so let's uh we want to talk about let's go ahead and talk about your upcoming film uh wild girls it uh is in production next month correct so tell me a little bit about that movie. Yes, yeah, so it's starting to shoot in April. Um, it's a film that I, I had in development many years ago as a drama. And um, it, it just it didn't quite work. It was very dark. It was a, it, there were some dark concepts in it. And it was after I shot um, uh, Tomorrow's Today out in New York City with a cast of, you know, two thirds were comedians, stand up comics. And I discovered that something that I really sort of already known about me, but I never really applied to film was that I can be funny. He's really funny. And um <laughs> and I and I, I you know I can do comedy. And so I I reapproached this material on it just sort of came to me. I woke up in the middle of the night and I said, it needs to be a comedy. And we need to we need to take this lighter. And the concept is that um I started in nineteen thirty two. And it's, uh, I picked, you know, and, and it came out of actually watching the internet and watching a Karen melting down in a, I don't know if that's a correct term anymore, but a Karen melting down in a supermarket about a sense of entitlement of something, how someone cut in line in front of her and how important she was. Interesting. And her having no clue that, you know, that no, the whole world doesn't revolve around you kind of a moment. And, um, and I just, I said, you know, I have a script like this. And so here's the basic concept is that um, these are two of the wealthiest heiresses on earth. And it's 1932 and their father commits suicide when the stock market collapses. And their evil aunts cheat them out of their inheritance and send them off to the country because they're the embarrassment because they don't have any money now. And they're sent off to the country theoretically to live in a house for a while until the the current 1932 trade papers, the media, the social pages sort of forget them. Because they weren't nice girls. And, and they, uh, they um, uh, uh, and actually what they want to do is sending them out to meet a hitman that's going to kill them. And, and that's that. But the, the, the comedy is based this way, um, that Tinsley, the main character, and Maddie are these two sisters, and Maddie is sort of a warm character, and Tinsley is the how would I say legally blonde? She has no sense of the world and how the world relates to her. She just thinks everything could come to her. These are two girls that have never been to the kitchen in their own house. They've never carried a bag. So, so never made a meal. So, uh, so Maddie and uh, and Tinsley are so inept at survival. I mean, they're they're experts at the social world, but they know nothing about survival. Right. And I, I, you know, I have a lot of New Yorker friends that probably wouldn't hold up just as well, uh, you know, being sent out to the forest somewhere. So it's 1932. It's Washington State. It's not electrified yet. And the hitman that meets them that's supposedly going to take them to their house, they're so inept and they're so uh, clumsy um, that they ask and they kill them and they wind up. Uh, lost in the forest. So it's sort of, um, how would I, you know, putting these kind of things together, it's sort of like, imagine Bear, Bear Girls, Man versus Wild, but two people who, you know, have never served themselves a meal and virtually ne- never dressed themselves. Interesting. So that, I like that. Yeah, so that was the start premise. And then um, what I did with it was I have them meet up with people from the countryside during the Great Depression, piece by piece by piece, how people that they meet up with, their absolute survival depends on interacting with these people in a humanistic way and uh and uh, uh and then they meet up with a mountain man uh uh, uh who's played by a stand-up comic teddy smith um uh, he's an amazing comic and um uh he, if, if they don't basically give over their will to him and if they don't interact with him they're going to perish and in fact i have a scene where there's a uh, uh, a mr nguyen who's uh, played by my uh, business partner for many years he's an actor named donovan lee and he's a Vietnamese character, and it's a great scene where they come up and they say, "Hey, Chinaman, uh, you know, could you help us?" He's like, yeah. I'm not Chinese. <laughs> I'm not Chinese. And then they don't get it. He goes, "Well, you know, we have some Chinamen back where we're from." And he goes, "Oh, you have them? Like you own them? You mean?" <laughs> and they have no clue what he's talking about. And at one point, and the the comedy is sort of 
he's talking to them in Vietnamese. And we're subtitling it where he's saying things like, these two girls are going to die in three days. They're going to get eaten by something. And they say, what did you say? And he said, I'm saying you're very beautiful. You're very, you're very lovely. Girl. <laughs> <laughs> That's really wonderful. Like, you know, have fun storming but, the castle. Uh, Princess Bride sort of feel in that moment. But the main the main concept of the film is is um, how we carry grief, how all the different characters in the film carry grief and how how that affects our lives, how our relationships are with the dead and how some of us never give up grieving and how some of us uh, become angry at grieving. And it, it has a, 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 a culmination where Essentially, people have to learn to forgive themselves for the terrible things they may have done and forgive others that have done terrible things to them. So not to be biblical or to put any religious perspective on it, but a, a way for humanity uh, to live. And that's that's sort of the, just the, the heart of the film. Um, and it's very transformative and see in each different character, whether it gets or takes them to a new place. I, I feel that... Um, when I put the script out, we, we auditioned 3,000 actresses to cast Tinsley. And um, I got back hundreds of, uh, of emails from actresses saying I cried halfway through the movie. I laughed and I cried, you know. It was better than Cats. <laughs> <laughs> Love that laugh. It was better than Cats. Loved it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, Tim, let me ask, um, you know, this is kind of a question I like to ask directors when they come on the show. Um, when you run a set, is it pretty tight knit or is there room for interpretations of the vision that you have? And I, and I, I go about that with actors nowadays, trying to take more creative control of a, uh, of a vision or a story. I mean, how, how do you handle situations like that, Tim? You know, I've been, I've been, you know, I've been working in the industry for 40 years and it's, and it's taken me a long time being an autistic person. I realized to sort of the technical side I had down 40 years ago. But it was learning the human side. It took me years, decades to figure out how to interact with people and how to to make that side work. And I, I can tell you this: that both um, Christopher Lambert and Kelly LeBrock, when they came on to Ten Days in a Madhouse, uh, Kelly told me first, and she said, "I've never been on a set like the way you run a set." And I said, "Oh, well, what's different about it?" And she said, "You treat every." crew member as if they're equally important and she said that, that's i've never seen that before you know usually they say break out you know break out a new six pack of uh of, of production assistants um you know get the lens meet in here and they you know it's it's a very cold kind of you know i mean and very hierarchical mm -hmm. and uh christopher told me that i run a film set like it's my living room and everyone is family so for me uh the the, the, the important thing is of course is that we have to get the script. We have to get the story the way that it was intended. There's a reason why everybody signed on to this. There's a reason investors put money into it. There's a reason distributors wanted to distribute this film. So you can't take a script that you sold everybody on and then go and make an entirely different movie. I mean, if you've done that, that happens all the time more with independence than it does with Hollywood films because they'll just keep reshooting, 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 reshooting until they get it how the script says or, or what they want. Whereas independence, it's, it's finished when everybody runs out of money. <laughs> and then you're going to, you know, wind up editing with what you have. And a, and a Hollywood film is finished when it's finished. And so, um, but for me, you know, the, the, how do I put this? I think it was Hitchcock who said, you know, you can, um, you can make a really bad movie from a really good script. But you can't make a really good movie from a bad script. Brilliant. So the God movie, first of all, is the script. It's the material that everybody's coming in to do. But with that said, then you hit reality. The actor isn't the person that was envisioned on the page. The actor has, they brought their own sensibilities to it. And everybody brings their own sensibilities. The set isn't exactly the same. The doorway is on the left instead of the right. And so the way I generally work is um, uh, I always hand the first takeover to the actor entirely. I just tell them blocking and I don't give them any direction at all. And, and the reason I do that is I, I kind of want them out there floundering and to see what they saw on their with their initial practice in their bedroom, looking at their in their mirror. Um, yeah, he's like, bring your excellence, give it all to me. Yeah, and so and uh, then exactly, <laughs> and so then so then after I get that first take, then I see what I've got, and I see how far it is from the spirit mm. of what we're trying to put out, 
And so I will then start working and I'll add a detail and I'll change things if necessary or find out, you know, why are you this way? Why are you doing it that way? Until we build something that synergistically everybody feels good about. Um, over the years, I've developed this philosophy where for actors, uh, for everybody on the set, everybody on the crew, I have two two modes that you can come and bring to my movie set. And one, you know, I will use a um, calmer word. How do I say a, a kinder word that I normally would use? And I'll say, you're either bringing excellence or you're bringing poop. And I don't say poop. <laughs> but, but, uh, That's what but, I tell you know, these guys. For the, yeah, yeah so, <laughs> so perfection is for the gods. But if there's only one state to be and it's excellence, that, is, that means the best that you can absolutely do. And so I'll sometimes stop a take and I'll say, is that excellence? Is that your excellence? That's the best you can do. And oftentimes yeah, the actors, shake. right, right. The, the actors yeah. will come and well, there, you did it. So there, there, there's sometimes the actors will come back and say, no, 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 I can do I can do more, I can do more. But once we sort of all get together and we all feel that rhythm and everybody feels involved and they all feel connected because, you know, you hire these people for a reason. They're bringing material, they're bringing themselves to the, the script for a reason. And, and I don't like just get in there and say the lines and do the thing and here, monkey what I'm showing you, this expression, copy me. Uh, it, it's got to come from within and, and, you know, whatever the technique is. I don't care. I've been doing this for so long that I don't care what, yeah, it's okay. I don't care what the, uh, you know, what the technique is. Um, uh, uh, you know, whether it's the Stanislavski method or it's, you know, Stella Stanislavski. Adler's method or, or it's the British method where people right. are essentially counting one, three, four, Blake, Peter look, Hawkins. you know. So, so it, it, that, that side doesn't matter, it's, it's, it's the, but it's the truth that they need to bring to understand the material, to understand, you know, wh what is the character's point where they're coming from. So with that said, um, I love to let the actors ad lit. I'll do the takes as we need to do to get the material down to make sure we're safe. There's what the script said. But now what can you do and how can we change up these lines and, um, and, and you know, what else can we do with it? And, and actors invariably, oh, I just happen to have written four pages of what I thought my character could be. Hmm. And, you know, and I let them go with it. As I tell them, you know, there's always the editing room floor. And so <laughs> the digital nice. age, you know, you never stop. You just get everything from every angle, have yeah. as many cameras as possible. And, you know. Well, when I started out, you know, I was an independent filmmaker, you know, a million years ago. And, you know, and take was it. You know, we were low budget independent. And I was still by my first film, Sunrise and Alphabet City, which nobody has seen because fortunately, I'd, early in my career, I met this pair of uh, pretend uh, to the movie business. And they happened to be named, um, one of them was named Harvey Weinstein. And I unfortunately helped them mount their first film. And I saw what these people were. I saw what he and his brother were. I saw this terribleness. And, you know, maybe this is my autism, but my first script was about the Weinsteins and how they were exploitive and terrible, horrible to you. people. And it was, Good for you. And it was a comedy. Well, you know, when I, when, I, when I tried to sell it to Hollywood, they said, oh, my God, this is the darkest movie ever made. Uh -huh. And sure. I, I self-distributed it to 35 cities. And all the critics said it was a light and during comedy, which is really interesting. Um, yeah. But uh, as an example, the filmmaker, they uh, he had a movie uh, called The Black Death that he was trying to sell. And it was a historical drama about, you know, how people burn people at the stake because they thought they brought evil spirits to them. And uh, and it was, it was very serious film. And this couple, I called them Mobius and Mullen. And uh, the, 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 the producers pick up the film and they rename it medieval blood feast of the sex mates and it makes a fortune and so he's furious <laughs> <The title. laughs> the filmmaker's furious so he goes and tries to steal his movie back and this is the kind of the way the comedy worked is that he busts into the office and he's got a gun he grabbed from his roommate and uh, he's going to try oh. to find his film and at a certain point at a certain point the, the, the producer which was like uh, harvey weinstein is who i was doing he stands up from behind his desk and he has no pants on Oh, God. And they start arguing about where's my film, where's my film. And while they're standing there, uh, a woman who was uh, an actress gets up in her, in her, uh, she's in her slip. She gets up and puts on her dress and puts on her earrings. They don't interact with her at all, and she just walks out of the room. Ooh. Oh man! <laughs> and she was also wow. Like and uh, so he hands the film over to this to, to the young filmmaker, and he goes on and throws it off the Brooklyn Bridge. Only at the very end to find out he's looking at it. And he goes, "Wait a minute." This isn't my film. <laughs> he didn't hand me my film. He had to be somebody else's movie. 
<laughs> so, you know, and, and when I took it to Hollywood, they were mortified that I was attacking the Weinsteins and that I was saying these terrible things about the Weinsteins. So I could not get distribution, but I'm I'm remounting it to to do a re-release of it next year. It's really a period piece now. Well, now, because it was set in the 80s so in New York City. That was, that was my next but, question. What's it like doing period pieces, Tim? Well, you know, <laughs> you tell yourself, oh, you know, how hard can it be? It's just a couple of, you know, some costume dresses from the costume. No, it's, 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 it's mortifying because... Well, we haven't heard the, the end of it over the wrong typewriter in 10 Days in a Madhouse. Right, right. We have yeah, a... Number four. <laughs> That's why I ask. No, you know, so we, yeah, we had a, 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 a reporter named Tom Henderson, uh, who's now, he writes for the Oregonian. Shoot there when I was trying to figure out where to where to you know mount this because it's the, another diehard life hand. Yeah, and then because uh, uh, the actual Blackwell's Madhouse was torn down and there's condominiums now and they renamed Blackwell's Island uh, Roosevelt Island now, so it's a luxury place. It isn't the place where uh, Typhoid Mary once spread disease. You right. know. Now it's inhabited by people who work at the UN. Exactly. So, <laughs> so um, uh, that's ironic. So, when I did the film, we had, you know, and, and, and Tom, he's a stickler for detail. And he said the typewriter at my desk, it, this typewriter wasn't invented for two more years. No. This typewriter was for two more years. So uh, he went to my production designer, said, you know, tell my production designer uh, about it. And so she went over and she took a piece of gaffer's tape and pulled it off and stuck it over the thing that said it was the wrong, the wrong make. <laughs> She stuck the gaffer's tape over it and it mortified him. Tom, so, there, there's no close-up of this typewriter in the movie. Yeah, but so, right. so what's it been? Ten years now, and at his wedding, he did a type he had a typewriter for his wedding cake. Mm -hmm. and he, <laughs> he's still talking about it, but, but problem with uh, with period pieces, and, and you know, for every filmmaker that's ever going to try this, one, there will always be for any film really. There's always going to be somebody in the audience who are the boot manufacturers who are going to go, the heels were wrong. Or the belt makers who are going to go, that's the wrong buckle. And, you know, as a whole, you have to, you know, you just simply, you know, like as George Lucas used to say, you know, you know, there never was a star. There never was a galaxy far, far away a long time ago. It was a warehouse in Van Nuys, California. Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, there's a there's a point where we're making a movie here, but you try your hardest to get all this stuff right. And you work really hard to please the majority. But the people who are specialists in any one area or have a specialty towards that area, like, I don't know, the, the the jerry curls on the bottom of the hair were a little too long. And there's a point where, especially when you're an independent doing it, you know, you're to me, it was like the minute I started making 10 Days in a Madhouse, it was like jumping into the water, but I can't quite swim. So I was like two and a half feet underwater, <gasps> coming up for air every so often, trying to put this together. You know, it, it was much larger than I ever realized. And you know, when we started making War of the Worlds, we were going to update it and then have an EMP weapon knock out all of our technology so people would be put back into the Victorian ages. And then when we remounted it as a period piece to be accurate to the book, I never really thought about it as a period piece. I just thought about it as a we had the wrong rifles. They needed to be Lee Enfield rifles. Everybody's talking about, you know, again, detail, detail. But but then yeah. when it comes down to it, you know, you're, you're trying to capture the spirit of a story. It's more important that we captured Nellie Bly. Again, when I auditioned for that one, we had, we did a, 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 a we had 8,000 people because YouTube wow. and uh, Google testing out a new platform. And so, so they, giant worldwide nobody was expecting all put in self-taped interviews and out of the 8,000 only two of them and only one of them really got it right but they all did it really serious she's in a madhouse and she's you know and like that and the way that uh, 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 Christina Ricci played it on uh, and when she did a, a version of it for the, um, the the Lifetime channel years later and again it was all serious and dark but what they missed about Nellie Bly was whenever she was nervous she laughed or smiled and she couldn't stop herself from laughing. So if she was going to be murdered, she would probably be laughing at that moment. And like thinking, you know, that, that was her go-to place. And her editor, uh, uh, Cochran, uh, actually said, if I could capture that smile and sell that smile, I would make a million dollars. And that's how she disarmed her. Was She couldn't stop herself from smiling. And there's a great scene in the movie when he says, you know, when they set this up and they're going to use these uh, Civil War techniques of... Um, uh, you know, instead of the reporters up until that time just going up and saying, they say you're dishonest, Senator, uh, can you confirm that? You know, <laughs> Nellie, Nellie Bly was one of the first people ever to go undercover, pretend to be mad, 
and get herself committed to the madhouse. And they, you and her editor right. had been a spy in the Civil War. So he was. They concocted this together. The idea that we'll pretend you're someone else. <laughs> what a you know now reporters have done that you know forever in a day. But but back then it was unique. And they were you know and 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 uh, we have Joseph Pulitzer in the story saying she's small, she's not going to survive. And then he finally says something along the lines of, well, if she dies, you know, we'll just sell more papers. OK. <laughs> and uh, and and, and the editor and this said. was all really was said. And then the editor said to her, you know, I'm really worried about that damn smile of yours. And then Nellie Bly, it's a great bit for Caroline Berry. She said, well, then I will smile no more. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, do you have any question for uh, Tim and Susan? I have a question. So if you guys didn't get into acting or directing, what would your fallback dream job be? Oh my, my fallback dream job would absolutely involve storytelling and working as a team. So I'd probably still be in the theater or making music or something collaborative like that. In other words, <laughs> doing the same thing you're doing, right? I'd be doing <laughs> something in a different venue. Perhaps. Uh, I, you know, it's just such a calling. I've always wanted to do movies and I toured on the road in, uh, you know, Broadway shows for a decade, lived out of a suitcase, promoted all sorts of, you know, um, Fortune 500 companies doing industrials, anything I could get my hands on. And I really wanted to do on camera work, but it didn't, I, I just had an older voice and I looked so young. I didn't really mesh. She's the, she time. was the voice of AT and T for a while. She was the voice. Oh wow! Okay. That had this. I have a voice that apparently you could listen to for twelve hours on a loop, and I wouldn't drive you mad. So I, I made a really good living doing it. Some you should. Too, that was my bread and job. You should start doing like a podcast to read books. I would listen to you at night to help go to sleep. Yeah. Oh, Donna, thank you so You're much. Welcome. So, so kind of the same for me. I I made my first fee, uh, my my first short film when I was eight years old. So I it kind Go of hard to imagine. Him. It's hard to imagine another world. I stole my father's movie camera. It was tell an eight millimeter. Tell about burning the house down. Don't I, just, <laughs> I made a, I made a version of War of the Worlds when I was uh, eight years old. That's and awesome. And I, yeah. I I built a miniature set in my bedroom and I waited until my parents went out. And I took my dad's camera that had, you know, like home movies on it from Christmas and whatnot, and I set it up. And then I poured, I put the spaceships in it, and then I poured lighter fluid all over the set. And I got <laughs> my glass of water ready to put the fire out after I filmed the scene. And I turned it on, filmed the thing, and it looked great. The buildings were burning great. They were, you know, about, about uh, two and a half feet tall, each of the buildings. And my dad had a machine shop, and I built it in. And then I threw the glass of water at everything and <laughs> didn't even touch it. So I went out to the kitchen at this point. I panicked. And my this in the era. The era was they had the flocked, the flocked ceilings Ooh, with the bumpy popcorn. Ceilings. Yeah, yeah. And I noticed that the popcorn ceilings were turning black up above. So I went in and I got a giant uh, pan, threw a pan on the set. That didn't help. And finally, the way I had to put the fire out is I had to go outside with the fire hose. I mean, with the, the, the you know, the garden hose, turn it on, drag it through the house. And then entirely doused my entire room with water. And, and what I didn't notice was the entire house, the flock ceilings were black all through the entire house. Yeah, so his mother just reflocked the ceilings. So the house did not burn down, but everything was black. But she, she knew my mother Love before him. she away. She, she heard these Love stories. From him. His mom and I were besties. And then so, so the, this was the first time I remember hearing in my life when my parents were having a discussion in another room. They were saying, what's wrong with our son, Tim? <laughs> what's wrong with our son? <laughs> what's, you know, it and, must have been hard having a golden goose as a son. I don't know. Yeah, he's creative. So, yeah, so I, 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 I can never imagine another reality. I wrote, I wrote books when I was a kid. I drew. I did comic books. And You'd probably I, be a comic book artist. Well, I, you know, I, I, I had 8,000 comic books when I was a kid. And I had was, back, back when, you know, Stanley yeah, and, and uh, not... Right, not too long after uh, uh, Steve Ditko, and it was a. Uh, uh, you almost met Steve Ditko. Yes, when we were making tomorrow's today. I was in New York, and the so editor close. of Marvel uh, was actually volunteering and helping on our film. And I said, you know, my my Christmas wish list of life would be if I could meet Steve Ditko, who first drew Spider Man. Yeah. And he's like, set it up for you. I mean, he's eccentric and he's weird. You're not, you know, it's not going to be what you expect. And I said, I know all about him. 
And so we set up to meet, and we were going to meet on that Thursday, and he passed away on Monday, days, oh. four days before I was going to meet him. So yeah. it, did, it wasn't meant to be. And I was just like, but, ah. you know, I had that, you know, that that close, but that, you know, that's how that goes. <laughs> so probably something collaborative, you know. I, I can't even. Well, you know what it would be? Possibly well, firefighter. I, I, I have to say one of, there you go. I can't get in the suit fast I, I could say this, though, that, you know, crazily for a short period of time, I I believed it was going to be a priest. So I would say that, you know, my life did become a calling of helping people, doing stories that, that you know, help people to have a better life, to have a better perspective. That's why I did 10 Days in a Madhouse. Um, that's why, you know, when Kelly LeBrock came on, she and I became friends because she's involved in like 200 human rights organizations. And we became besties because of, you know, of doing service and work for the world. Um, she's quite I, I, I would, I'm sure I would, if I were not to do nothing with entertainment, I would be involved in, in you know, in a, in a different way rather than being a voice or a mouthpiece that, that tries to help people that way. I would have worked in you know, human service. I'm, I'm myself. I'm in like a hundred women's rights organiz, you know, yeah. activist organizations, human rights organizations. Yeah, I'd probably be a teacher. And uh, yeah, this is an interesting question. So you know, because <laughs> it's a lot to live, you know, but it, but it's always been this, you know, that you know, just go watch Elvis, and that's yeah. our life without the success part. <laughs> so we thank you guys for coming on. Um, do you guys have anything you want to tell your fans and where to find everything, uh, all your uh, content? Well, I will share with you that um, that the last film I did, which is another humanistic story about a man who worked for the mob and then his son was run over by a hit and run driver, uh, pulled himself out of the mob and then started helping people get out of the mob. And tomorrow's today. Tomorrow's today. That's my last film. It's on. It's been picked up by like 60, 60 platforms, 60 channels. Oh, we're going to be featured next month on Voodoo. Voodoo's going to we're going to be the prime film featured on Voodoo next month. And it's, it's doing gangbusters. War of the Worlds, you can find on Amazon. War of the Worlds, the true story. That's the what it is. Story. I did it as a, as a mock documentary. And then uh, 10 Days in a Madhouse, you can find everywhere. Um, uh, uh, where were we? Where, where, with Christopher we it, yeah. Lander. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to remaster it in 4K. But uh, uh, 10 Days is, you know, it's part of the, the tapestry of life now in, in America and in the world. It's done well. Yes, and, you should be so proud. You know, there's going to be an opera of 10 Days in a Madhouse. And Timothy wow. is the one who came up with using the number of it spell so this is the part yeah that's my great uh, achievement in life i changed well, the teeth and, stamp on it. and you brought <laughs> Nella Bly to world attention where she had been forgotten but I, I, I would share also when we get the wild girls when it comes out this year um it's uh it's starring a newcomer uh lydia pearl pence that we auditioned and she everyone out and uh kelly Sclari, um who's an amazing young actress she's just fresh out of acting school her father her father camera skills her father is uh the late great peter scolari who was one of the bosom buddies uh if you saw ever watch the lena dunham's dad and girls he was lena dunham's dad but but that's not her credential that was her dad and and she's she's just absolutely amazing and we have uh interestingly i've cast uh an act uh, a social media star named Alyssa mckay McKay, yeah. and she has a character and uh, uh she she's doing really quite well she gets about uh Three three billion. She just did a piece of about three billion hit uh, viewers a month, uh, and she's you know she puts out a podcast and she gets like five or six million on it. And at first and she's a really good actress. You know if you can listen on camera, if you can convey all the myriad of going on inside through your eyes, she has that. I'm really excited and she's, to have her. She's playing one of the the two aunts. That send the girls off into the forest to have oh, to, you know, face. Very nice. Topics. You know, the, the film has a, a, a beautiful arc. I cast a, a Colin uh, Buckingham, uh, who uh, who has dwarfism, and uh, he plays a, a major character in the film. He's a projectionist in the film, an engineer, uh, who it's the Great Depression, and so he lives in an attic that he runs and. Um, and has uh, 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 you know has dreams of designing airplanes, you know, like that. And I've got a lot of like how I deal with you know sort of sexism, racism, and all those kinds of things. Like Tinsley says to him, uh, that's the you know one of the wild girls. She says, you know, finding a girl, fi- finding someone like yourself, and and he turns to her and he says, oh, you mean a blonde? 
you know, I play with it like that. And and, uh, and she refers to her sister in the movie as poor blood because her family were were only knights was the lesser mobility for 500 years. Cecily and Maddie are half sisters. They're half sisters. Yeah. And she says, yes, you're side of the family. You were only knights, so you were the lesser mobility. So through the entire film, she doesn't refer to her sister as Maddie. She calls her poor blood. And when they meet up with Teddy, who's black, and he hears that, he said, well, if she's poor blood, what am I to you? <laughs> and she goes, uh, 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 he goes, no, I'm just messing with you, you know, like that. But, you know, but uh, so like it addresses a lot of those kinds of things, but it's not a film for, you know, one side of the fence for the other. I want everyone super to come to the film. Super I, funny. I don't believe in only preaching to the choir. I believe in wanting to bring everybody on board and to see where we need to join as humanity. We need to find where, you know, the world, as we all know, is super right. polarized right now. And there was once a day where that was secondary to us all working together as people and where we had dialogues as opposed to war with each other. And we need to find a way back to that because we're not going to progress forward in the world where everyone is continuing to be at war with each other unless it's a bloody mess at the end. And that's not what we want. People who have actually lived through wars will tell you. I so what we need more. to do is to open up those places of dialogue, be comfortable enough to be sit, sit at a table with people who absolutely oppose what you think and hear their ideas and try and change their ideas and then still walk away without having murdered each other, you know, and that's what it's got to come down to. Or we're never going to listen to each other. It's just going to, it's, you know, it's going to come to an end and, and the world needs to move forward. It won't look anything like what it looks like today, like it didn't in the past. And I set, you know, uh, the wild girls in 1932 because it was a time when they keep apologizing to people for not having money. And every person that they say this to says, nobody has any money. What are you talking about? Nobody has any money. What do you, and so that, that's taken out of the equation and everything of all their politics and everything is taken out of the equation. And what do you find if you don't, if you don't lend yourself to these other people, you're going to perish mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you have to, you know, they have to rely on the quote Chinaman who's actually a Vietnamese person. They have to work with the black man who, you know, they, 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 you know, they've they only had spoken to a black person, except before. for, except for in servitude you know, who served them. And and they have to, you know, make, you know, make these understandings and, and, and adapt. And, you know, and I'm, one last thing I'll share with you about, about for me as a filmmaker, as I go forward in the world, I've got a film I'm shooting uh, 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 right after I do The Wild Girls uh, with uh, Ray Fiennes. Uh, Champagne Charlie. Yeah, Champagne Charlie, about a couple from Britain who are sold vineyard only to come out and find out they were actually sold a land of sagebrush. <laughs> and they have and they, it's a good it's a good comedy and uh and they're you know she's not cast yet but they're they're, they're talking of the sales agent in the film so we'll see we'll see how that works but i'm more interested in films where you know i love john wick where you know you know he does the fights and all of this and and the thing for me that i'm more interested in is uh, I would much rather see in the end where the villain isn't thwarted and destroyed and then stands there on the edge of the bridge as they got the arrow through them and we see the light in their eyes as the Avengers kill them. I like it better where the, where the villain wakes up Mom, and realizes me. what they've done and turns and becomes a good guy and, and joins the, um, you know, and joins the cause, so to speak. So I would say out of all of the Marvel movies, you know, the Tobey Maguire movie with Spider-Man and uh, Doc Ock, where Doc Ock realizes what yeah. he's done. And, and Doc Ock is the one who actually saves everybody. You know, he, he yeah. did the, he made the mess, but he sacrifices his own life. And to me, yes, that's what I want. And in a sense, that's what I, what I did in Tomorrow's Day. I don't want to give it away, but the, the, the gangster film, I have certain members of the gangster community wake up to what's going on and make a change. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'd rather inspire because if I just do movies where the villain is killed, well, we already know how to do that. All you need is a gun. But how do you change that person's mind who was doing something wrong their entire life, the wrong course, and get them to wake up one day, suddenly Mom, start handing out? I, no. I think this child is there. <laughs> she is. She snuck in. I put on YouTube. She'll be fine, maybe. <laughs> We appreciate you guys coming on. Sorry about that. We appreciate you guys coming on. Thank you so much. It's been a great show with you guys. Awesome. You guys are wonderful. Thanks for sharing. Thank Love you. having you guys. Thank you so much. So have a great night, guys. You too. All right, guys. Thank you all. You bet. Thanks.